Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I really couldn't be better today, Tim. I hope every single one of our listeners out there couldn't be better as well. And I hope you, Tim, couldn't be better. I hope you're literally sitting there thinking, I don't know any way I could be better. How are you? I literally couldn't be any better, Lance. You nailed it. Thanks a lot for asking. And I'm really excited to introduce this interview that we had with a wonderful journalist. Her name is Lauren Bright Pacheco, and she is also a podcaster and has done several podcasts. But the one that we're talking about today is called Murder in Oregon. And it is about the 1989 murder of Michael Frankie and the wrongful conviction of Frank Gable. It is a really fascinating story that Lauren tells us about this murder murder about this assassination really of Michael Frankie she gets into how the justice system is completely broken and how if they want somebody convicted for a crime for whatever reason it is uh, very quick to judge and takes no responsibility when they have realized that they've made a mistake or a, a mistake has been made so we get into that and we get into what type of a person Michael Frankie was sort of a crusader and back in those times not a lot of people were as progressive as he was when it came to reforming the criminal justice system and he was fighting a corrupt prison system that is essentially what got him assassinated his descent of the system and his challenge to them to make things better and to clean up that corruption and really it's a shame that somebody who was trying to make such positive headway was taken down in the prime of his career i mean you can say it's still unsolved even though Frank Gable was convicted. And Frank Gable is currently out of prison, and he has a GoFundMe. If you go to GoFundMe.com, you can look up Frank Gable Freedom Fund. Interestingly enough, it is organized by Kevin Frankie, who is Michael Frankie's brother. So the Frankie brothers have organized to make sure that Frank Gable continues to live his life outside of prison as a free man because they don't believe that he is responsible at all for their brother's murder. I hope you enjoy this interview this conversation and i hope you check out murder in oregon from lauren bright pacheco and all the links for her shows will be in the show notes along with the link to that gofundme and if you're watching this on youtube there is a qr code that you can simply scan and it will lead you directly to that gofundme page every little bit helps and yes this is a great interview but tim people are asking if i want this great interview without ads where do i go and i'm just i don't know what to tell them we've got an answer here you can go to crawlspace .supportingcast.fm and you can sign up for Crawl Space Premium and you can also now do that via Apple Podcasts as well. You'll get ad-free episodes plus our weekly bonus show called The Subscription Show where we discuss and dissect our interviews from that week and behind the scenes life here at Crawl Space Media. And Tim, former U.S. Marshal Art Roderick called me last night and he said that he was trying to follow us on social media and I didn't know what to tell him. Yeah, shoot him my number. I'll be happy to let him know that he can follow us on social social media at crawlspace podcast or crawlspace pod thanks a lot for listening everybody we really appreciate it and for those of you who are listening on the subscription service you will not hear these ads that are coming up but those who are on the public feed will so stick around for the interview following the ads thanks to our sponsors and now we're back to the program Lauren Bright Pacheco, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? I am a little chilly because I'm in the East. Other than that, I'm doing well. Definitely can commiserate with you on this feeling chilly business. It is cold over here in the East. It is a little, a little chilly. Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm so glad to be here. I really enjoy your podcast, you guys. Well, thank you. Yeah, we enjoy yours. And I just want to say how grateful I am for the string of guests that we've had on in the past few months. And you are one of the latest that we've always been excited to talk to and have on the show. So welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. You're very accomplished in the podcast, the true crime podcast space. You worked on the Happy Face podcast, Murder in Oregon and Murder in Illinois as well. Yes. And then I produce other podcasts on the side, but I started out in television. Always really had a problem wrapping my head around that format in terms of storytelling because I was in daytime television particularly. So, you know, you have to kind of condense everybody into these pithy little 20 second sound bites and you only have two minutes to tell a person's life story tops. And so for me, podcasting really just was so liberating. And I had met a woman named Melissa Jesperson Moore, who was a contributor on the show that I 
I was working on. And it's a show of dubious distinction. I, I was working on the Dr. Oz show, daytime television, which meant something very different before the political <laughs> climate <laughs> came, came to be. And so Melissa and I had spent a lot of time traveling together, doing true crime stories. And a lot of the stories that people end up hearing in Happy Face sound authentic because they really were. I mean, we had a true friendship that we forged driving to and from locations in the middle of the farmland late at night or early in the morning. And I had no idea what the hell I was doing the first time I attempted to work on a podcast. And that was kind of a blessing because it meant that it wasn't going to sound like anything else. I had always, coming from television, just really wanted to create very visual audio, if if you can imagine such a thing, a kind of story you can see with your eyes closed. Happy Face has one of the best logos that I've ever seen for a podcast. It's super clever. Who came up with that? How did the name even come about? So Happy Face was something that we were working on with How Stuff Works, which was a great company out of Georgia, and then kind of was enveloped with uh, in a deal with iHeart, which is how I'm now working with iHeart. That actually was something that we were sitting around the table and Keith Hunter Jesperson's known as the happy face killer. So there were a lot of names that were being kicked around that had more to do with a coming of age tale of Melissa grappling with the fact that her father, Keith Hunter Jesperson, was a serial murderer and rapist. And that's something she discovered at the age of 15 when, you know, most people have a lot of other things that they're coming to terms with. And that was just a layer on that onion. Someone at the table threw out Happy Face, and that really felt like a good fit to all involved. Yeah, well, it's it's a compelling story. It's a, a wildly successful podcast, I would say. Can you tell us a little bit about Murder in Oregon? How did you get started working on that case? There is a crime reporter named Phil Stamford who was a writer for the Oregonian at the time. And he's actually the man who gave Keith Hunter Jesperson the happy face moniker. He created it because Jesperson was sending the newspaper these taunting letters bragging about his kills and signing them with a little smiley face face. If you were to ask Phil Stanford about it today, he would not want credit for having created that because he did not think that Keith Hunter Jesperson was any Hannibal Lecter by any means. He thought he was a big dumb farm boy who got away with the murders he committed because he was transient. He was a long haul trucker. He gave himself the nickname by signing things with a little smiley face. So Phil downplays that. But when I basically politely stalked him to get him to be a part of the Happy Face podcast. He wanted nothing to do with it, but I was pretty persistent. He begrudgingly agreed and we struck up a friendship. And the whole time we were working on Happy Face, he would say, I don't even know why you want to focus on this story. I've got another story that you really should put your attention to. Michael Frankie was the former head of corrections for the state of Oregon. And in 1989, he was stabbed through the heart outside the building where he worked, the dome building in Salem, Oregon. It was deemed a routine car burglary gone bad. But the crazy thing was this happened where his car was parked, which was clearly put in the parking spot that was labeled director of the Department of Corrections. <laughs> Any routine car burglar might look for a different car rather than breaking into the car of the guy who runs the Department of Corrections. So there were a couple of red flags almost immediately, particularly to Michael Frankie's brothers, not the least of which being that Michael Frankie was a former college football player. He was also six foot four. He was in great shape just as a hobby played ultra competitive, almost contact basketball. And the guy who they ended up pinning the murders on Frank Gable was five foot nine, maybe in padded socks, a very slim man. I sure I outweigh him any given day, even before Thanksgiving. <laughs> and the theory being that because he was hopped up on meth, that enabled him to overpower and overcome a six foot four man and pierce him through the heart with what could only have been a very difficult contact wound to make. But 
On top of it, Michael Frankie had discovered rampant corruption within his own department. And the murder happened the night before he was about to reveal the findings of his internal investigation to a legislative committee on the exact topic. So the timing was a red flag as well. What did the crime scene tell you? It's interesting because the dome building in Salem, they've restored it up to uh, its its what would have been its initial splendor. But at the time, it was a little bit in disrepair. So there were some plants in the front that were overgrown. But as you look at the front of the building, to the left, there is a kind of porch, which they call a portico. And that would have been about 150 feet away from the parking spot of the director of corrections. It was also a shortcut to Michael Frankie's office. So when the stab occurred, Michael Frankie would have had seconds to live. He managed to make it physically 150 feet to that side door on that portico, smash the door to gain entrance, and was found basically dead in a puddle of his own blood, surrounded by glass from having smashed the glass of the door. Multiple people were trying to get a hold of him at this time. Co-workers, people who had realized that he had gone missing. And so there was to have been an extensive search by two men who were employees of Frankie's department who claimed they searched the whole building top to bottom. And yet they missed the broken glass that you could see clearly from inside the office. And they missed his body lying on the portico outside. In those times, Frankie would have had a beeper. And if multiple people were trying to get in touch with him, that beeper would have been going off as well. In addition, one of those guys who did that search claimed afterwards that he was afraid that he would encounter Frankie, who he was afraid might have shot himself and killed himself because his second marriage had just dissolved. Now, that's incredibly interesting if you think about the fact that Michael Frankie's brother, Kevin, was initially told that his brother was shot, not stabbed. And so... Kevin has come to the theory that that was the intention because he had uncovered so much corruption and because that corruption was exceptionally profitable to the people who were perpetuating it, that they were going to kill Frankie and make it look like a suicide, have him shoot himself at his desk. And that's where the body would have been found. But something went wrong and the plan went south. And as a result, Frankie was stabbed through the heart. So when you're describing how he made it from one point to the next point, including smashing his way through a door, this must have created quite a scene. Were there any witnesses that had seen this or anybody coming forward to say that they heard a struggle or anything? There was a maintenance man who claimed to have heard a kind of gasp and seen somebody in a trench coat going one direction and another person running the other way. That may or may not have been Michael Frankie and the unnamed assailant, but there were also people who claimed to have seen a Xerox copy maintenance man wearing a pinstripe suit in the dome building. There there were no eyewitnesses for the actual murder. It kind of sounds like a, quite a scene was created um, with the broken glass, and obviously his body is laying there in blood, and then there's a beeping sound. It's just peculiar that it took so long to find him. Hours. And again, that would be in keeping with the theory that it was very much anticipated that he would be dead and his body would be found, just not where and how it was. The thinking was that if they were going to make it look like a suicide, he had been approached by somebody with a knife to get him back to his office so that they could escort him to a place where it would look like a sensical suicide. So does that mean that whoever said that he was shot is kind of like an immediate suspect? You would think, but you know, this case remains so mired in 
controversy. It really is one of Oregon's most mysterious and enduring murder mysteries. It remains an unsolved murder. Uh, if you ask me, if you ask the four federal judges who've recently ruled on the innocence of the man who served nearly 30 years for a murder he didn't commit, and if you ask Michael Frankie's brothers, Pat and Kevin particularly. There's this whole meth theory as well. 1989 didn't feel like to me a time when meth was that popular. Was this something that was a problem in the city at the time? Well, absolutely. The really interesting thing about Salem, Oregon, is the fact that it housed all the prisons in Oregon. And so it had this very interesting culture of people who worked in corrections and people who were serving time. And then you had the families of both who would come and put down roots. So there was a very seedy underbelly of Salem and there was a lot of corruption. And part of the corruption that was uncovered was the fact that drugs were being smuggled into the prison and contraband was being smuggled out because the prison system at that time was so overcrowded, which is part of the reason why Governor Neil Goldschmidt at the time brought in Michael Frankie to clean it up and, and, and to kind of do some problem solving. They had a hot bunk program, which means that they would rotate prisoners in and out of the prison so that they could make the most use of the overcrowding. And then when they would let the prisoners out, they were doing what they did best, which was criming, and then coming in. And so there was a steady influx. There were also a lot of reports of corruption within corrections of basically people in high positions of power using inmates as their own muscle by letting them out on the weekends, allowing them to do their bidding, and then putting them back in prison. In, but never having signed them out. So they had the perfect alibi of, of never having any record that they were out during the times in which the crimes they committed were committed. Wow, interesting. So the corruption that Frankie was about to expose mostly had to do with the prison system. Yep. And the man who was the assistant AG at the time, who fully intended to move in to Frankie's position, was pushed out of the way. And that created a very dysfunctional dynamic of loyalty within what had been very much an old boys network of people rubbing one another's backs. And then Frankie moves in and he's the whistleblower and he's the outsider. And it was easier to get rid of him. So you had mentioned that he was brought in to clean it up, clean up the, the prison system. Was there a specific plan that he wanted to put in place? Yeah, you know, it's very interesting because I had to listen to to a lot of presentations that Michael Frankie gave. And I really got to know him very well through his brothers. So he was the middle brother of a family of three, but he was very much the role model to both his older brother and to his younger brother. And he was a bit of a visionary, pretty much ahead of his time in terms of criminal reform and the way in which we approach rehabilitating people. He really looked and saw the problems that drove the perpetual cycle of going in and out of prison for so many people, namely poverty, lack of education. You know, there's that expression that broken people break things. And, and he really wanted to invest in the long haul solutions to the issue of why people wound up in prison in the first place. And that actually didn't make him too popular with people who had already realized in, you know, 1989, that it's pretty profitable to keep people in prison. It really is. And unfortunately, in our country, we do have a prison for profit system. So so there are some people, unfortunately, who aren't too interested in investing in the programs and, and the resources that'll keep people out of prison in the first place. You mentioned that the corruption was bringing in money for people. Uh, I guess how many people and like what roles were those? It's wild because when I spoke to a fellow who was a former state representative for the podcast, a guy named Chuck Sides, who's just a walking wealth of, of, of great stories about Oregon's past and the kind of corruption that played into politics and into corruption. He really pointed out that 
corrections, like the mob is a family business, you will have a brother and a father and a cousin and an aunt. And so it keeps it within the family. And in Salem, particularly, there was a lot of money being made by drugs being smuggled into the prison system. I spoke to the daughter of a woman who was going in and out of the prison three times a day and smuggling drugs on her person, inside her person, and leaving. And that's something that, first of all, you're not supposed to be able to go in and out of a prison three times a day um, and not sign the guest book for two of those times. That level of corruption doesn't exist without protection. And that protection comes from within law enforcement within the side that's supposed to be enforcing the rules that are put in place to keep things like that from happening. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. So I'm sure with all of this happening and all of the corruption, I'm sure the investigation into his murder was very smooth and seamless <laughs> and had no red tape. Open and shut case. Open and shut. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, it was for poor Frank Gable. So it took them 14 months to make an arrest. And you had a high ranking public official who's basically assassinated in the parking lot outside of the building where he walks in front of the sign that says that the car clearly belongs to, to the director of the Department of Corrections. And it takes them 14 months. And the way in which they ended up getting a conviction for this guy, who had an alibi, by the way, they rounded up the usual suspects. I mean, it sounds like a bad movie, but it's true. Eight people who all had very obvious incentive to testify against Gable. And then they put them on the stand. And what's interesting in this case is they were using basically lie detector tests to train their witnesses. So they're using polygraph tests over and over and over again until they can create a version of the truth that, that will work on the stand. And one of the witnesses, Jody Swearingen, was a young teenage addict at the time, and they gave her 19 polygraph tests preparing her to testify. All of those were admissible in court, right? I'm not even joking when I tell you that when this went in front of the Ninth Circuit Court, we'll go into, I'm sure, the, the current legal updates. The judge, one of the three judges pointed out, there's no other word for this. This is misconduct. And the prosecution's defense was, that's just the way they did things back then. So this individual, Jody Swearingen, she testified? Yes. Before a grand jury, and she later recanted? Lance, all of the witnesses, I think with the exception of one, have now recanted their testimony, you know, and explained exactly why. They thought he was a snitch. I was told they'd drop all my charges. There was very, very flagrant incentive for all of these witnesses to make up testimony. And were most of those witnesses prisoners? Yes, and or had records. I mean, these were the usual suspects that they had scooped up from the seediest areas of Salem. You made me nervous there when you used my name. I thought you were going to say, Lance, I just said that. No, that was that was a personalized. That was a personalized response. <laughs> very, very well delivered. I, I did. I was like, oh, no, what did I miss? <laughs> <laughs> that you were in trouble. Just makes you wonder how often this happens. And ugh. I will tell you that I just taped a guest episode of Wrongful Conviction, which um, is one of my favorite podcasts. I absolutely adore Jason Flom and, and Maggie Freeling. But the similarities of this case to the one that I just taped about, which happened in Connecticut, frightening that this seems to be a page out of the prosecutor's playbook where you don't have a case so you can easily manufacture one by incentivizing testimony. We want to believe that it is far-fetched and isolated, but unfortunately, it's kind of business as usual. What really frustrates me about that business as usual is that it's harder to actually do this than do business as usual. 
if you just went about your day to day and weren't corrupt, your job would probably be a little bit easier. It's so funny you said that because that's almost the exact words of this gentleman, Mark Shand, who was framed in Connecticut. That's exactly what happened to Frank Gable as well. I mean, these are cases of actual innocence. And in this recent case, the fellow in Connecticut, he had seven eyewitnesses for his alibi, and he was still convicted to life in prison for a murder he didn't commit, a murder he was in another state 30 miles away when the murder occurred. My God. Well, tell us about the updates in this case. What is happening with Frank Gable's conviction? So in 2019, a federal judge had, luckily, Frank has done a tremendous amount of work on his own behalf, but he crossed paths, I think, in 2017 with a federal public defender named Nell Brown. That is probably one of the most admirable jobs in the judicial system, if you ask me, and she is probably one of the best. So she writes this 198-page habeas corpus, which is just a master class in dismantling the prosecution's case. And it goes in front of a federal judge, Acosta, and he rules in 2019 in Frank's favor that no jury, had they been given all of the information that existed at the time, would have convicted him. Because another man, Johnny Krause, had actually come forward and said he did it twice, not just once, twice. And they weren't willing to follow that because they didn't like the people that it led to because it was going to expose the very, very obvious trail of corruption in this case. And so the department, DOJ of Oregon, appealed that ruling to the Ninth Circuit Court, and three more judges upheld Acosta's 2019 ruling. And so that happened in September of this year. So it took almost two years for that process. And they again ruled in Frank's favor. So that happened at the end of September. And you think, oh my goodness, great. This this 30-year nightmare for this poor guy, and he served nearly 30 years, is almost over. And think about the hell that he's had to live in, in this weird kind of purgatory of being out, but not knowing if the state's going to appeal it and if you're going to have to go back in. So the end of September, ninth, you know, circuit court, upholds Acosta's ruling, and the state of Oregon had until December of this year to decide whether or not they were going to appeal to the Supreme Court. Now, keep in mind, their entire case has been dismantled. It's blown out of the water. They don't have a case. This has been called misconduct, that no you know, reasonable jury would have convicted them. And they didn't take until December of this year to decide if they're going to go to the Supreme Court. They decided at the end of October, they're going to the Supreme Court to revisit putting Frank Gable back in prison. What? Is there still time for them to drop this case? One would hope. Um, And I also have to tell you that the brothers of Michael Frankie have always supported Frank Gable's innocence. Frank Gable has always maintained his innocence. And at this point, It's hard to understand the jackassery of um, (laughs) the Department of Justice in Oregon pursuing this. It's very difficult. They're just punching air. And you question, is it because they don't want to have to compensate this man for the fact that they've ruined his life? Or are they just waiting for him to die? Are they trying to just drag it out? Either which way, it's the antithesis of what we want to believe justice is in this country. We want to believe that justice is thoughtful and takes its time. And then if it were to realize that a mistake had been made, it would be quickly corrected. It's not. You know, it, it just, it, it, it unfortunately, our system is really quick to judge and very, very slow to take responsibility for having made a mistake. But pretty easy to keep people in those for-profit prisons. Unfortunately, yes. I mean, over and over again, I, as I said, I, I love the Wrongful Conviction podcast, but you realize that even when somebody is proven absolutely innocent, it can take them another decade 
15 years to get out of prison. And you mentioned that they might just be waiting for him to die. Is he in poor health or it's just he's getting up there in age? He's actually only about 59 at this point, but definitely his health has been negatively impacted. He came out of prison in 2019 ill, which one would be given the lack of proper care, but also the stress of this and the stress has continued. So he's definitely dealt and weathered with some health challenges, but he's married, you know, would very much like to get on with his life. A life that includes, by the way, close friendships with both Kevin Frankie and Pat Frankie. They have created a GoFundMe to support him because that's that's the other problem with our system. Even when you have a wrongful conviction, the person walks out into what? You know, often they have no family, they have no resources, they have no job to return to. You know, Frank's been very much hard at work creating a semblance of a life since 2019 that he has done with the knowledge that it could be taken away from him again at any given time. That's really terrifying when we hear stories about people who either they were a small time criminal, like you know, marijuana dealer or something like that, or they didn't break any law, like how easy it is once you get into the system, get into the gears of the system, it's so quick to put somebody away and so and almost impossible if they're innocent. So I could be walking on the street and somehow match the description of somebody. And if it needs to be taken care of in a more efficient manner, I could go to jail. I could go to jail for 20 years screaming that I'm innocent. Because it's once the system decides that you're guilty and once that tunnel vision sets in, you've got a whole machine that is moving towards making that happen as efficiently as possible. But when it comes to reversing that, putting the brakes on it and reversing, there's really nothing in place that is that efficient or effective. You have wonderful innocence projects and organizations that are really trying to, to right some of these wrongs, but you have no shortage of them. I think that it is conservatively estimated that between 4 and 6% of people currently in prison are innocent think about that i mean that 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 would mean what one in one in 20 convictions are wrongful convictions you've a lot of people who are sitting in prison because they they can't make bail that they haven't even been properly tried and convicted and we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors thanks to our sponsors and now we're back to the program you mentioned that frank got uh, married again was that somebody that he had met while he was incarcerated Yes. And, and you know that that's actually something that's interesting. The number of love stories that actually come to fruition while people are incarcerated, that is a silver lining to all of this. But he has married a wonderful woman. It's very interesting. I did not speak to Frank for the podcast because his federal public defender asked me not to. And she has been very, very wary the whole time of having the attention from the podcast support Frank, because the fear is it could go either which way. But with wrongful convictions, what's so interesting right now, if you look at what just happened with Serial, when people have exhausted entirely their appeals in terms of our judicial system, podcasting has kind of become another round of trying a case in the court of public opinion. And sometimes it's that attention to the mistakes that were made or the possible corruption or misconduct that shines a light and actually forces the system to take responsibility for the mistakes that have been made. And that's what I think is an incredibly powerful side of podcasting. Indeed. Yeah, I love that as well. And uh, I, I'm wondering what's going on with this Johnny Krause guy. So he confessed twice. Yes. And he's dead. He's passed. They not only had another suspect, they had one who confessed and they chose not to pursue that because of the people that that would have led to. But it sounds pretty clear that he was probably the the actual killer, huh? They spent more time trying to explain why he wasn't and why it was a false confession as opposed to, and it goes to what you were saying, that you'd think it would be easier instead of concocting a case against basically a patsy to just do the work to actually solve the crime. But if you don't want that crime solved, 
because it sheds a light on corruption and misconduct, sometimes it's easier to just create a fall guy. Did Krauss implicate anybody? That would be the people that it led to. Multiple examples of people higher up within corrections who purposefully did not pursue Krauss. So pursuing Krauss would have been essentially the same work that Frankie was doing anyway, it seems like. Yes, in terms of of, of the bold face names. It's such a sick cycle to me to think about people who are in these positions of power who have engaged in some form of corruption. And then when that is threatening to be revealed, then they have to engage in more corruption to cover that up until it comes down to this murder. And I don't mean to laugh because it's not funny. It's just it's in it, like it blows my mind. It's a murder that we have to stage as a suicide because this person is going to uncover everything that we've been trying to cover up. And it just keeps circling and circling and circling and snowballing. And at some point, you'd think that somebody in this corruption circle. Maybe that's the case here. You know, there has to be a whistleblower that can just put an end to it. But once it gets to a a large enough ball, like when does, how, how do you stop that? How do you stop that from rolling down the hill and just taking everything with it? You know, it's funny when you said the thing about uh, laughing, Bill Stanford particularly cannot talk about any of this with a little bit of wary chuckle. I mean, it's the, the corruption is so ingrained that it's almost comical to him because so many people are oblivious to it or they are adamant that it doesn't exist. Unfortunately, with power comes the potential for corruption. That power does corrupt. And when that corruption also enriches people in power, it becomes a vicious cycle because then anybody they're bringing up in the system, they are basically indoctrinating into that corruption because they have they have their interest to protect. There are plenty of good people in law enforcement. There are plenty of good people in corrections, but unfortunately, there are bad ones as well. And that's unfortunate, but it's something that we have to take into account when we look at particularly our eye for an eye mentality in in our system. Well, it's not an eye for an eye when it's just arbitrary. (laughs) No, it's, it's not an exchange there. And so that's, that's one of the best arguments against the death penalty that I've ever heard, the number of times they get it wrong. You know, Illinois did away with the death penalty because there were so many people on death row who were proven to be actually innocent. As you're producing a show like this, what's going through your mind as you're uncovering these details and realizing that maybe something that you say about these people might not be safe for your own well-being? Do you ever get that sense? Yes and no. I I, I think that I'm a little bit too pig-headed and a little bit too naive, or at least was in the initial stages of murder in Oregon. My dad had been a corporate attorney, and he was a very principled one. He was the chairman of the Board of Ethics for the New York State Bar Association. And so I grew up visiting his beautiful mahogany-lined office with the leather furniture and a beautiful painting of John justice a gentleman throwing himself at the feet of a judge who was standing next to lady justice who's holding a scale and blind but it was very dramatic but i very much believed that the system protected the innocent and punish the corrupt. It was Jason Flom who had the comment when I said, you know, justice isn't blind. And he said, no, but I think she's deaf and dumb too, that that it really isn't what we want to believe it is, should or could be. And so I didn't fear for my safety when I started doing murder in Oregon until I started putting the pieces together and realizing how far it went up. It went all the way up to the then governor because he was compromised. The Oregonian, the newspaper that Phil Stanford wrote for, claimed that he had had an inappropriate relationship with a young girl. She was 13 when it started. It wasn't inappropriate. It was rape. He was a pedophile and ended up ruining this woman's life. The people in power within law enforcement and corrections had dirt on the governor 
So even though he brought Michael Frankie in, and I don't believe that Neil Goldschmidt had anything to do with his murder, he certainly wasn't going to pursue it as diligently as he would or could, because that was not in his power, given how compromised he was. Are you going to release updates on murder in Oregon? I hope to have a better one than the last one we just did. We did release an update after the September ruling that upheld Judge Acosta's initial ruling to let Frank out of prison. I would love nothing more than to update it that he has now been exonerated. You know, there would be nothing better than to think that the state of Oregon is going to stop, to use the word that Michael Frankie's brothers use, persecuting, persecuting this man. He's innocent. You've done amazing work on this. What's next for you? Right after murder in Oregon, I uh, dove into Murder in Illinois, which is a very polarizing podcast. It dealt with a family annihilator who I have come to believe is absolutely innocent of the the crimes of which he's been convicted. He's serving four life sentences for the murder of his wife and three children. But when you take on a family annihilator case, it's going to be polarizing. So if you go on Apple, you'll see their one star reviews and five star reviews. People either think it's the worst, most vile thing ever, or that it's a worthwhile use of one's time. But now I'm working on a podcast called Murder in Miami. And I, I chuckled to myself when you asked if I was afraid of dangerous things, because I have teamed up again with Bill Stanford. And this deals with a time period in the early 1980s, when he dropped out of being a political journalist, and he ended up in Miami right before the era of the cocaine cowboy. And he starts writing crime pieces and then through a weird twist of fate ends up working for a private investigation firm called Intercept, which may or may not be a front for a drug smuggling operation that is working with CIA oversight. This doesn't sound dangerous. Not at all. So so, so now I'm, I'm probably going to have to check my car before I started in the morning. <laughs> but yes, and the private detective whose job he ended up stepping into had been murdered and left in the Everglades for alligators before Phil took on the job. And when did this take place? The early 80s? 1981. Good luck. It's a great one. It really, it really You'll is. You'll smash it. It'll be <laughs> great. Yeah. You'll do a great job. For sure, it's, yeah. It's it's a fascinating one with with more twists and turns than a than a bowl of spaghetti absolutely but it's it's a good one nice and how do you keep all of your information straight do you have like a bulletin board with different colored strings you know what up in my office i do have a, a board that i do write and draw things to but for the most part caffeine i mean without caffeine there is nothing the color is dark but the power is clear well, Lauren Bright Pacheco, thank you so much for speaking with us here today. This was a, a great conversation. We really appreciate your time and your work on these cases and in the true crime community. It's much appreciated. Well, I appreciate you guys too. Thank you so much for having me. 